Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 340 for Monday, March 14th, 2022. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire at the moment. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. Uh, Mr. Kent. So I am, uh, I am here in Durham, as I said, but only for another, well, less than 24 hours. I'm, I'm doing a hybrid thing, Paul. I'm attending South by Southwest partially remotely this this past weekend and today and then tomorrow i get on a plane to go to austin to actually do it in person i have some things to talk about it, I, it's been an interesting experience I, obviously i am not at the end of it yet i'm only in the middle but it's it's I, I think there's benefit to this whole like zooming out there's benefits of this whole conference hybrid thing because there's some things you don't need to be in person for and some things you absolutely value in person so uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, I'll, I'll, I've got two. I saw two movies that are worth talking about, and then I will mention two that probably aren't worth talking a whole lot about. But that's okay. That's kind of how it works. So, tell me. So, um, the last year, well, th- this is the first year in three years that South by Southwest is in person because it was one. It was the first conference in the United States that was canceled in 2020 with a week, you know, a week out uh, for COVID. And so that was kind of a mess trying to, you know, put that online, you know, with a week's notice that with no preparation or anything, but last year, and they did a fine job, but last year they knew they weren't going to have it in person. And they put all these things in, in place. It was a little weird watching band showcases from like somebody's rehearsal room or whatever, but, um, some of the conference sessions were okay, like some of the talks, the keynotes and things like that. And then what especially worked out well was the movies. Uh, you know, I all, I always enjoy and, and get a lot of value out of seeing movies at South by Southwest. Um, I tend to focus on the section they call 24 beats per second, which are all the music related movies, generally documentaries. And, uh, and I was able to watch a lot of those, you know, um, in advance back, uh, you know, a year ago, that Tom Petty movie, I think was one of them, you know, several others. And, uh, and so, and, and it's always, it's interesting because when you're on the ground in Austin, you know, you're paying for a hotel room, you're, you know, crammed into a theater, you've got to wait in line and, you know, do all the things that you need to do to get people into a room together to watch a movie at the same time. And this weekend I was able to sit on my couch and watch movies or, mm. or, you know, I, I rejiggered my studio. I was telling you before the show that I had to, I decided to tear everything apart and then rebuild it. I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll leave the nitty gritty for another time. But, um, I was able to have some of these movies and keynotes on while I was doing that. And it was like, okay, interesting. And there, there, there was one movie where I was like, okay, wait, I don't want to watch this while I'm distracted. I want to sit and engage with this movie. But some of them, especially documentaries, can be a little bit, you know, you don't necessarily have to be paying visual attention. It's, you know, especially for like keynote speeches and things like that. Uh, it's great right. to just, you know, just to hear them because it's essentially just a podcast. And you're watching two people talk, you know, or three people talk or whatever. So, sure. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that it, it worked out. And part of this, of course, you miss the engagement with other attendees where you can talk about the movie and process it together. You know, it, it is not a shared experience in that way. But the the first movie I watched was Cheryl, which is a documentary about Cheryl Crow. Uh, she is 60 now, which sort of blew me away because she still <laughs> she still looks like she's like 25 or whatever. But a fantastic movie. Highly recommend it. I, again, it, these things that I get to see at South by Southwest, I see in advance of of when you all will be able to see them. But I guarantee you this one's coming. Like it, there's, I got to yeah. ask, though, like it, I'm not aware of any of any things in Sheryl Crow's life that make it particularly, you know, she became, you know, she was a music teacher and she became a rock star. Right. And I know there, there was the, you know, Wednesday night music club, you know, episode of her life. And, yep. but I mean, it, what makes it, 
an interesting doc. What about our life is so fascinating. It, that was the thing is I, I didn't know what to expect going into this. I, I, I probably would have gone out of my way to see it in person because it's about Cheryl Crow. So I know it's going to get a decent amount of attention to build this movie. Right. It's not just going to be some hack job. Right. And it yep. uh, and for sure it was not. It was it was you know exactly what I expected. But um, but yeah, it, it was an interesting thing. The, the first thing. You know that Eagles documentary that came out a few years ago and it starts in silence and you hear them singing the harmonies for Seven Bridges Road and then you realize it's, you know, it sounds perfectly mixed and then you realize, oh my gosh, this was just recorded with some crappy 70s, you know, camcorder or something. Yeah. There, there was a moment not quite as, as it wasn't built to be as impactful as that. But toward the beginning of this was her just on stage at soundcheck with her band uh, working through the harmonies of this tune, I Shall Believe. And she and she's singing it and she stops and she's like, can we get three parts on that? And then she just counts it back in without even talking about what's going to happen first, you know, other than I want the other two of you singing. And yeah. and you hear them. And even the first time through, it's like, it's perfect. What? Like, <laughs> screw you. And then they stopped and she's like, okay, that's, that's pretty good. What are you doing? And, and, you know, the person sang the part and then the other one was like, what are you doing? And he's like, you know, this guy's got this falsetto thing. And she's like, yeah, all right, that works. And it's like, of course it works. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. But it was, you know, it was just such a matter of fact thing. And you get that feeling like, oh, okay. Not that I know. I, I actually had got the opportunity to see Sheryl Crow. I was actually right up against the stage at one of those private JBL parties at uh, at CES one year and and she I mean you know she is the real deal she's a piano player she majored in piano right. performance at at uh, Missouri in Missouri and uh then she got like she was trying to do stuff and and you know working in Missouri and she got this McDonald's commercial where she made uh she was teaching she was a teacher uh and and she got this McDonald's commercial where she sang, you know, the McDonald's low, you know, tagline or whatever, and made yeah. more in that 45 minutes worth of work than she did, you know, in, in, in the entire previous year teaching. And that's when she told her family, that's it, I'm moving to L.A. And <laughs> this, this is for the birds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and then when she got there, she was totally green. She drove <laughs> literally like got a list of all of the recording studios in L.A. And then um got a map and mapped out where they were and came up with a route. And she just drove from one studio to the next, handing out her, uh, her demo tapes thinking, Oh, this is how it works. And of course it, it, it doesn't work. Um, but she did, uh, she was working as a waitress and she broke the rules and gave a demo tape to an agent who was, you know, a customer. She got fired uh, for doing it, but that person got her a ton of work and, and, you know, so she kind of forced her way into the commercial business was, was how it was. And and then she heard about where Michael Jackson was having auditions for singers, backup singers for his upcoming tour. And she showed up. She did not. She was not on the list. She, you know, she didn't have an invite or anything, but she's just like, I'm Cheryl, you know, and wound up getting the gig. And every night I forget the tune, but they had some videos of it. She was not just at the back of the stage. She came, you know, down and, and hung 10 off the front of the stage with Michael singing a duet with him every night and learned yeah. to hold her own on that stage, you know, with these crazy wigs and short skirts and, you know, the whole thing that Michael Jackson would, you know, that would, that would fit in. Uh, yeah. It was, it was like, I just can't stop loving you with Michael Jackson every night. And, and that opened more doors for her. She started to, to meet some people. And then, like you said, you called it the Wednesday night music club. It was actually the Tuesday night music club, which was the, also the title of her first album. I never quite realized that was a jam session. And right. I, do you, do you know that that kind of, she kind of burned herself with, with that. Uh, well, on I'll Letterman. actually tell you. Yeah. So go ahead. So yeah. We actually, there's a house rocker connection to that. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So our our bass player, Chris Beveridge, was in a band called Giraffe, that uh, spectacular band. And um, they were local in the Bay Area, but they won uh, a, like the Yamaha Soundcheck competition over like 500 or 5,000 bands. They were flown to Japan to headline. I mean, just a really oh, wow. big deal. That band, Giraffe, 
where Chris Beveridge was a bassist, the lead, the leader of that band was a guy named Kevin Gilbert. And Kevin Gilbert uh, has a really remarkable but very short story. Um, and he was part of the Tuesday Night Music yeah. Club. And I think a connection there is that he actually had a romantic relationship with Cheryl. Oh, that's possible. Sure. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Interesting. So from house rocker bass player to former band to Cheryl Crow. So That's here, two degrees of separation. You know, here was the thing. It was this Tuesday night music club was just people getting together and and effectively just getting hammered and playing music. You know, I, I'm oversimplifying it, but I think we all understand that vibe, right? It just happened to be a lot of really talented people, and and they were loose, right? It was intentionally not a you know you, anything went, you know. So it was like, okay, well, you play guitar on this song, and you know, we'll just mess around. And one day, but they liked the way Cheryl sang, uh, for obviously, you know, for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and one day or one night, they, they you know, were, were drinking or whatever. They walked down to the local bookstore and bought a poetry book uh, and then came back and they found this poem fun that um, that's the first line of it was all, all I want to do is have a little fun or something. And and Cheryl just started reading it. In, in this sort of laid back style over this kind of, you know, groovy little thing that, that the musicians started playing. And then they were, they were all songwriters. And so, you know, when they realized it sounded kind of cool, they were like, all right, well, we need to, we need to add a hook to this, you know, cause you're doing this sort of laid back groovy thing and then it's got to have a hook. And that's when they came up with the, all I want to do, you know, is have some fun. And yeah. And that tune obviously hit huge, right? And so she put it on this Tuesday Night Music Club thing, and uh, and you know other tunes as well. And I I think I think wasn't leaving Las Vegas on on that record too. And she went to Letterman and played, and then like Letterman would do, he had her yep. over to the couch to you know the chairs or whatever to you know chit chat, and she started asking. Or he started asking her, you know, is this song autobiographical? And she was, you know, completely starstruck and, you know, didn't have her feet under her at all, sitting here on the couch with Letterman, like blowing her away. And she says, yes. And they proceeded to have this conversation that was sort of silly. And on the surface, you or me watching it would be like, you know what? She was charming. Who cares if the real story didn't come out? It no, it's fine. Like she was she entertained and then she entertained like she knew not to just be quiet you know it wasn't like watching Sid Barrett uh, you know get interviewed it was <laughs> she she was you know engaging and it was fine but none of it was true and it wasn't an intentional lie at least so she, so she says and there's no reason not to really believe her but she completely you know she could have said no i'm part of this great jam session with all these great songwriters and you know this song came out of that like she could have told the actual story and did so does she own up to it in the in the document oh in the documentary of course she owns up to it she's like oh yeah if i had that to do she's like that you know of all the moments in my life that's the one i've replayed countless times even the next day you know she was like oh this is going to this is this is bad you know <laughs> and, and but she just didn't know you know she was it, things happen and yeah. the, those people got pissed at her. The writer of the poem, they, you know, was, had been contacted previously by the, by the, them at the Tuesday night music club and said, look, you know, we'll always make sure to give you credit and all of this stuff. And of course, none of that happened and it burned her in the industry yeah. for a while. And then her second record, her co-writer and producer walked out like the day that they were going to start writing and recording. And she was like, Oh, Oh, like, can I do this on my own? You know? And she wound up, you know, she's had a couple of, and still, still does maintains some lifelong partnerships with musicians and, and songwriters that really have, have worked for her. But obviously she's, you know, she's got songwriting talent and, and she, yeah. she can sing and she can perform and, you know, all of that stuff. But she's had an interesting career. It, you know, it was, it was, it was interesting. She was saying, I think I talked on, I think on this show last year that I watched an interview with Carol King, uh, who was being interviewed to talk about being a female in the music industry. And she was saying, I never had any trouble with it. You know, it was, it was almost like huh. hmm, interesting. Okay, but fine. I'm glad that was your experience, but why did they have her here to talk about this? And Cheryl cited, 
Carol King is one of her influences for obvious reasons. And but she said, you know, it was tough coming up in this music business. You know, the 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 whole idea of the casting couch was something that was and I'm, I'm using the wrong terms, but I think we all know, you know, that the you 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 will if you do favors for the people, they will do things for you. And and she always pulled, you know, railed against that. But she kept finding herself in that position. She said it very much was a real thing. And and she lost, you know, agents and producers over that as well as as this Letterman indiscretion, too. But, you know, she had to she had to kind of, you know, bear down and, and figure it out and, you know, do the work and make it happen. And and it did. So it was a, it was a fascinating story. Well told, really right, engaging cool. documentary. I highly recommend it. I didn't I spoiled a few of the highlights, but, um, you know, yeah. you'll, you'll 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 get something out of it. So, you know. And then look forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. It'll, it'll make it out. The next one that I saw is called 32 sounds. And it was interesting to watch at home. And that was my only option. I think it, it oddly for a music movie, it, and the Cheryl Crow movie was the same way that it would premiere at the beginning of the, the thing and not premiere during the music festival, which doesn't really start until tomorrow, but, but it, it did. Uh, and it's a movie about sound. Uh, the interesting thing was it it is it has been created as a film and that's what I watched but it is a film uh, uh that was is essentially cre- was created from the script that is used when this happens in person it was a film made by well, I mean lots of people but there's you know two main hosts if you will and they go around and put on this show live where they talk about different sounds. The audience wears headphones so that you can really hear and be immersed in things. Uh, and it, the, the fir- it is 32 different sounds interspersed with a lot of dialogue about and, and just lessons about how sound works and, and these other things. And it, it's very interesting, very engaging. And the movie works 100%. In fact, I sat down on my couch and the first thing they say in the movie is, we hope you're wearing headphones. And there's an Apple TV app for South by Southwest. That's how I'm able to log in and, you know, watch these mm-hmm. movies that are for me. And I remembered, oh, right, I can, my AirPods can sync to my Apple TV super easy. And so I grabbed my AirPods and I put them in. And I, my wife was gone this weekend. So there I was silent. And, you know, the house was silent uh, with the TV on and me sitting on the couch for, you know, an hour and a half with, with headphones in, which is just a weird sort of juxtaposition <laughs> of things. But, but it made... It was amazing because they there was there's sections of it where they focus on the whole binaural thing. Uh, so you, you're getting spatial awareness of the sound created by the movie. And I, I. Like I said, the movie 100 percent works. I was fully engaged and, you know, never even once grabbed my phone to like, you know, check something because I was bored or whatever, you know, uh, but. It made me think, dang it, I wish I was there for the in-person performance of this. Yeah, you, you know, cool. yeah, because it, it like that's a cool thing. And what an interesting thing to be in a room full of people with all with headphones on. The room is effectively silent. Uh, and then there's even one part in the movie where it's like, OK, we're going to have a five minute dance break right now. And and uh, and they're like, just get up and, and move. You know, it's fine. Like, it's all good. And uh, it was a really interesting thing. Um, th- there's a, there's a whole thing of, they, they talk a lot about, uh, and, and work a lot with and show a lot with Foley artists. Uh, so my guess is this in-person thing is the host sort of narrating through this and then showing these clips that have the, the sound. So, because there is a visual element, although there are also moments where they say, close your eyes. I will tell you when to open them. You won't miss anything. I promise. And at one point I did, I didn't trust that. So I was like, well, what's on the screen? It's like, oh, it's gray. At one point, though, with your eyes closed, the screen starts doing some things that are intended for you to experience with closed eyes. And that is also cool. And I will just leave it at that. But this Foley artist, again, I don't want to I don't want to ruin a whole lot, but I don't think it would be uh, combine the concept of a Foley artist, which if you don't know what that is, that's the person uh, that works typically in movies, although you hear Foley artists on like old school radio shows too, making all the sounds to enhance what you're hearing or seeing or both. Uh, Combine a a 
very talented Foley artist with the concept of if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, did it make a sound? And I will just leave those two things out there. You'll watch the movie someday, hopefully, and and um, and it and and you'll you'll appreciate it. It was it it was interesting watching this though. You know, so many movies, the soundtrack is super important, right? But almost meant at times meant to be foundational and and supportive of what's happening on the screen. This was that upside down and the screen supported the sounds, but it meant that certain things needed to be cut out like music. There, so often in, in films, even documentaries, you know, you've kind of got music playing as a background, as a backdrop. And in this, they, they even said it in the thing. They're like, we had to be really careful not to, um, not to just put theme music in like you normally would in a movie or, you know, background music because all the sound that you're hearing is so intentional that right. we needed to make sure not to downplay any of that. So it was really interesting, you know, I, on many, many, many levels, this experience about sound. So I, I anyway, you'll, you'll, I, I no doubt you'll get to see it when you do do whatever it takes for your environment to wear headphones when you watch this movie. I, I can't Got stress it. that enough. Uh, it, it just, you know, I started, like I said, I started watching it with speakers on. I'm like, it'll be fine. I have a surround sound system. It's going to be amazing. And they were like, we hope you have headphones on. And then I went back and played that same intro scene with headphones on. It's like, oh, okay, this is a hundred percent different experience. <laughs> so, so, these, so these expensive Apple headphones that I bought are going to come in handy. Mm-hmm. But really, you could just get any headphones and plug them into your computer and watch the movie that way. I, I would say if if the easiest way for you to watch this, to watch a movie with headphones is on your computer, deprioritize de the fact that you've got a, you know, 75 inch plasma screen or whatever, you know, and and just like watch it on your 15 inch laptop screen and and use the headphones because that's going to be the most important experience you have with it. So cool. There were two other movies that I saw in the music realm. One was I Get Knocked Down, which is about the band Chumbawamba. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure. This one I did watch while I was cleaning through my office and my studio here. It, it was interesting. I don't know what the story was, though. It wasn't all altogether engaging. They were a punk band that was kind of on the ropes, and then they had a hit, you know, and, and now they're coming back to that. So... I, I'm not, maybe I, maybe I missed out by not being in a theater and forced to not be, you know, doing something else, but that one, I'm um, maybe I'll revisit. Uh, the other one that was weird was this movie called this much. I know to be true, which is about Nick cave uh, and his musician slash songwriting partner, Warren Ellis creating their, uh, these these two albums and then performing them together in a on a sound stage, but it was like super weird. I mean, it's Nick Cave, so I suppose mm -hmm. I should. That's that's to that's a given, right? But it's like take what you would get with David Byrne and go like four more notches weird, right? It, I don't know. It just was it, it. And again, maybe I missed out on not being, you know, in an immersive environment like a theater. Uh, watching it. So, uh, but it know that you're in for this ethereal kind of thing. It was not the right thing to watch while you had other things to do. Maybe uh, that's, that's certainly, and I saw Lizzo's keynote, which was, um, it was actually entertaining as you would imagine, you know, I, no. why, why, I don't, I don't know very much about her. I like her. I like one or two of her songs yeah. I've heard, but yeah. what was entertaining about the keynote? She, I mean, it was just her and, and someone else talking, you know, uh, for about an hour. And, um, it, you know, she is an entertainer at every level, not just a, a singer and songwriter, but, but she is, she is an entertaining personality. And it was Angela Yee from my heart media, who, uh, was her, her interviewer, as she went through this and, and talked about, she's got a new uh, TV series coming up. And so it was, you know, this is part of the promotion tour of that, but, yeah. um, but it, it, it was, she, you know, she's very, she, she's obviously, a, if you've ever seen Lizzo, you know that she is a, a full bodied woman 
And and she actually had a lot to say about that and and, you know, um, a lot to say about how to quite quite intentionally made that part of her brand, though. Right. It's part of her brand about that. That, That's right. It's part of her brand. And and she talked about, you know, being comfortable in your own skin and and all that stuff, both, you know, metaphorically and physically and and all that. So there were there were some she's a thoughtful human. And and it was it was great to hear her thoughts. Yeah. It interspersed with her being Lizzo and being entertaining and goofy and, you know, all of those things that, that, that Lizzo is. But, yeah, it was good. So, so I got a couple of things to share yeah, with man. you. So, one. I played a gig, too, but I'll, I, I want to hear from you and then I'll, 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 we'll circle back to that. Yeah. All right. I am crazy busy. I'm playing like 14 to 20 gigs a month. Wow. Me. Yeah. I mean, like, I think kind of all the work I've done to kind of get my where I live now, life going is kind of kicked in all of, all at once. And then the house rockers, you know, are, are starting to fill in. And, you know, I have my one week in a month, uh, March, April, May. And then it's actually starting in May. It'll be two weekends a month. We have a lot of corporate gigs, you know, private gigs. So good paying stuff. And just the, the calendar is really full. I don't know if this is reflexively, to, you know, a result of, you know, COVID or yeah. kind of passing, maybe passing, um, or <laughs> or if it's, um, you know, just all the work I've been doing to kind of amass two regions of places to book. But in any case, I'm crazy busy. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, and last weekend I did three acoustic gigs down here. Two were great, 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 great. The third was good, but it was a college bar because I live in a college town. Right. And one, one thing about college bars – College kids do well. They were they were pretty perplexed by the music I was playing. So so I was trying to find where to connect. And you know my my repertoire gets up towards the '90s mostly, and not a whole lot past that, right? Like I, I, I do a Death Cab for Cutie song, and you know, sure. It, it, that's about it. And that's it, it. It was pretty much background to them. And even the older Beatles stuff, you'd kind of get a couple people turning around and acknowledging, but it wasn't. I didn't have a string of songs where I grabbed attention. I mean, I even tried to do Take Me Home Country Roads just to see. Got a couple people turn around smiling. But, I mean, these were like 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. Yeah. And so there was a pretty good disconnect. I mean, it was cool. It was nice. It wasn't it wasn't hostile. But definitely not a good tip night. So, right. so live and learn, learn well, for that, co- right? I would imagine anything related to college bar is not going to be a good tip night, even if you played all the songs they wanted to hear. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I uh, don't know. But, I mean, you know, I could be it was wrong. A cool bar. Yeah. The beer was great. The food was great. So, you know, we'll we'll take it for that. Anyway, then uh, the House Rockers played a a private party. A good House Rocker fan who's been wanting to get us to play a party wanted to do this during before COVID. Wanted to do it in January, but COVID wasn't far enough in the rearview mirror for that. So we finally got it together uh, this past weekend. He took such great care of the band. I mean, you know, paid us great. Dinner was included. He bought us our first round of drinks. And at our first break, he comes into the break room, the green room, and gives everybody a tip, you know, individually. I mean, we, we everybody was great. The people were so nice. It was cool. Wow. And, you know, the funny thing, I have a really good reflection on that. So I'm always looking for ways for the band to be different, right? Sure. And we spend an inordinate amount of time on, like, making arrangements pop and finding songs. And I'm actually thinking now – we started playing Sweet Caroline again and at the end of the show and it goes over so good. And I'm like, why are we why are we running from these songs, right? Brick House, Sweet Caroline, Brown Eyed Girl. You know, we could we talk about the GB stuff. Some things, I think there's a statute of limitations that has expired. I don't think anybody's really heard Brick House in a while. I don't I actually think it's you need to have Freebird in your in your show if you're a cover band, right? It's going to get called, and it's going to get called ironically. And if you turn around and play it non-ironically, it it can create a pretty good moment for you. Oh yeah, no, they they I, I don't play Freebird often, but uh, I think I've told on this this show, and I'm happy if I never play it again. Only not because I dislike the song; it's an amazing song, it's fantastic. But the time that I played it was one of those moments where it was exactly like you said, called ironically. We started playing it and the energy in the room shifted and it was like, no, we're going to, we're going to, we're playing this. But we yeah. realized we were going to play it as the crowd realized we were going to play. <laughs> like, you know, it was like, oh, we're going to keep going with this. Like, okay, we're in, it, you know, there was that moment where the whole room knew we were in and that included all of us on stage. It was the night that the Boston bomber was found. 
And uh-huh. so that the energy in the room was pretty triumphant. Uh, and that was a great way to sort of channel that. Uh, and it was, it was awesome, but yeah, it's a great song. I, you know, I've always felt like, listen, if you're going to play in a cover band, play the, co- I mean, the whole point of that is to play the songs that people want to hear and to celebrate them together. It, it, you know, it, it hopefully isn't the thing that you hear from so many jaded musicians. And I hope it's just a, a, you know, very vocal minority where it's like, well, I hate that song, but I play it because it makes me money. It's like, okay, well, sure. I mean, I get it. Put food on the table. And, and I, I, I don't, I don't disparage that, but hopefully it can be a thing where even if it's not your favorite song to listen to, just putting that energy into the room and seeing how it resonates with people is all it takes to lift everything up, including you. Uh, yeah, I, I've never quite understood the idea of, well, I, I play in a cover band, but I'm only going to play like these songs that are special to me. It's like, but that's that thing that we've been talking about. You haven't seen my fastball, right? Like, yeah. like I, I, I am such a, so many if uh, that's your thing, professional musicians, join an original, like, like write your own songs, but be in an original band like that. Like well, that's that vibe, right? Like but I, for those who don't have that skill, I mean, think, you know, and I can, I can appreciate this. Sure. What you do if you're a semi-professional musician and you get enamored with with being a performing semi professional musician, you are often stuck on the. I am such a great student of music. I am going to dig into these songs that uh, that I know are special to me, and I'm going to be able to make them show them how show everybody how smart I am, and and make the make these songs special to you. I think that is a a a, a philosophy of the semi professional you know, band, like, like this is my creative output. I don't want to play the songs everybody does. I want to be more clever. But this, to me, that dot is line right to the ongoing conversation about the professionals versus the, versus the semi-professionals, right? So this is like the professionals want to play, play well, you know, and, and get paid and delight an audience and yeah. so they can get paid again. Right. Yeah. Whereas the semi-professional, the guys who say, I, I do it for the love of music. I do it for my art. I do it for other stuff. You know, again, it is your art in that you're, you're playing music and you're performing music, but it's someone else's song. Right. So, you know, take it a little bit with a grain of salt that, yeah. you know, your art involves leveraging someone else's art. But, um, yeah, I think that those two, those two concepts are are connected. Like, in any case, I do believe there's a statute of limitations in a lot of these songs. Most bands probably have not played Freebird in 10 or 20 years. Right. 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 You know, and it's become this ironic thing. Yeah. But I was thinking about this is, you know, we have a cool, you know, horn arrangement, our version. It's not even our version of, of Sweet Caroline, and we're playing it pretty much straight to the form, but just our instrumentation with a nice big horn section makes the song pop in a, in a different kind of way. And people smile and they laugh and they hug each other and they sing along and they, they, you know, we play it at the end of the night and they walk out on a high. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? That, that's the that's whole our thing. job. Right. That's why you play Sweet Caroline. Uh, yeah. I would, I would say we play it at almost every Monkey Fist gig and probably every Chafed gig because it like, why wouldn't you? It's great. We, and certainly every Uptown gig where we, where we also play Brick House like that, you know, that's a, I love that tune. That's a, that's a fun one to, uh, it is. it's got such you. a groove. I, and I, I mean, yeah. I know like, you, you know, you'll go back, you'll listen to the drummer and you'll be like, why would it, why would a drummer like that groove? It's Cause it's got like, it, think of that pocket, man. Pocket. Like pocket. Yeah, you just, yeah. you're in it. And then there's that one, you know, hit where you're hitting like the, the end of three and on four, or right? The end of one and, and two, right. You know, bop, bop. And then otherwise, you're just like right in the groove. Oh, love it. Love it. It's kind of like, uh, thank you for letting me be myself, right? It's, oh, you know what? That would be a good one to segue, like to medley together. Yeah. Yeah. I would say the one that's in danger of going into mothballs for a while is probably Uptown Funk. Because, yes, everybody plays it, yeah. whether you're a heavy metal band or anything like that. <laughs> and that's starting to feel like this, you know, the song that is overplayed. But all these other songs we're talking about that have become. But if the crowd wants to hear, what does overplayed mean? Like that, like I, if you're a cover band, that's no, the, no, 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 no. I'm saying overplayed, and there's listener fatigue, right? Uh-huh. There's, there's not okay. a there's not right. a wow factor to pulling it out. I'm my point. I'm making is brown eyed. Well, maybe not brown eyed girl. Maybe maybe not. Depending on depending on your crowd, I guess. But 
you know, Freebird, Sweet Caroline, Margaritaville, some of these ones that that cover bands of a certain age and genre have kind of mothballed. You've probably mothballed them for 20 years, and yeah. and it's okay. I'm saying it's I okay to bring them back. I see it's what you're saying. It's, it, so we're talking about crowd fatigue. Screw the band fatigue, right? We're talking about yeah. crowd fatigue. And if yeah, if it's the song that is going to go over well with the crowd, then then I it's worth considering playing it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. All right. Now I now I see what your what your angle is here. I'm totally with you. Yeah. 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 So like I said, I think I think Uptown Funk is teetering yeah. on yeah. on uh, on every band of every genre has played it at every show, if not once but twice, and um, <laughs> and may, maybe that one's about to go into a place. But you know, it's a freaking great song, and it will come back when it's when it's non ironic. Right. I guess that's it. It's en- it's entering the ironic zone. It might. I can see what you're saying. Yeah, where people where the crowd will be like, oh. <sighs> Here we go again. You know, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I don't know. I certainly never experienced a time when a crowd was like, oh, man, Mustang Sally again. Like crowds have it, any of the times I've played in a cover band. You know, I'm 50 years old, but I didn't really start playing in cover bands until my original my, the first original phase of my life sort of wrapped up. And that was, you know, maybe mid 20s. And really, my exposure to cover bands was sort of backdoored in with. I mean, I filled in with some cover bands, but the the first quote unquote cover band I was in was the blues band that I played with with Murray Woods and Tangle Blue in Austin. And it was that was an original project. It was actually slated to go on the road. And if the record company that he was signed with hadn't had a like family dispute that went on years, we would have. But we played about half of Murray's originals and then half, you know, old blues tunes or not old blues tunes, blues tunes, blues rock tunes, those sorts of things. And then from there, it kind of spiraled out. Um and it was when I joined the responders. That's really when I, when I was back in Connecticut, that's, that was kind of the first real cover band that, um, mm-hmm. that I was part of, but I've never experienced, you know, that ironic period where the crowd feels like Mustang Sally is ironic. Uh, I'm sure maybe, it did, it's, maybe it it's happened. It's somewhat circular, it right? You know, the me. band can kind of feed that thing, right? right? The band is rolling its eyes when they're about to play something, you know, Sometimes the band will will dictate to the audience how they're going to feel about a song. But, you know, Mustang Sally is a really interesting one because, again, you get it played in a lot of different styles of bands, buzzy guitars, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, uh, if you're a semi-professional musician, you probably are keenly aware that any musicians in the audience are going, oh, can you believe they're going to play that? And yeah. that might be shaping your vibe. <laughs> yeah, other musicians might have it. But can you imagine, like, if you were – the commitments, right? And you pulled out Mustang Sally and you did a straight up Wilson Pickett, soulful, nailed it, pocket, non-ironic, just really poured yourself into it and did what that song can do to a crowd. Why wouldn't you want to do that every night? Every night. And you're right. I'd forgotten. It was the commitments that brought Mustang Sally into like the back in to the cover band world. I think, I think so. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So. Yeah, I like it. Treat her right is a tune. Now that we're talking about the commitments, Great tongue. right? Like, why isn't Great. that played more often? I feel like you don't have to know that tune to love it the first time you're in a crowd, sweating, and a band is just like tearing through that tune, right? Yep. Yep. I think we played that once in uh, in the All Star Band, early, early, like second or third gig. I don't remember, but I love that song. There's a Southside it, Johnny. Yeah, it was you it. that brought Bruce it in. Covered it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's a funny. great that's a tune. One. And it, well, like, you know, because it, it breaks and then it picks up right. and then it bops and then everything. It is a great tune. But like, why did Shout like become in the, the you know, the, the GB Blues canon? Brothers. No, no, no. But, but like Blues Brothers and Commitments clearly have both had an influence on the cover band, you know, the GB song list, if you will. Right. right. Mustang Sally. Okay, great. That's from, you know, that's from the commitments shout from the blues brothers. Why didn't treat her right? Like follow Mustang Sally right in the movie. The, to the set list. It is in the movie, uh, isn't it? Or is it just on the soundtrack? I don't remember seeing it in the movie. I'm pretty sure it was in the movie. Shamalama Ding Dong was in the movie. I could have been wrong about this. Hmm. Ah, now, uh, commitments movie song track soundtrack. See now I gotta know. This is interesting. I could have sworn that it was in there, but I, you know, what do I know? I'm just some idiot. Great, it is a great tune. 
Oh, treat her, treat her right is uh, is song number eight of fourteen on the uh, on the original motion picture soundtrack from nineteen ninety one. Well, the other, the other thing is uh, treat her right. The difference is Mustang Sally and and shout um, are sing alongs. Oh, I see what you're saying. No, that's you're totally right. Treat her right is a performance which has a call and response, but not really for the crowd to call and respond. Right. Yeah. Ah, hey, 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 it. hey. Yeah. Like yeah. It. No, yeah, you're totally right. You're totally right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I like it. I like it. And we can, we can thank the, uh, the black crows for bringing Otis Redding back right up into the, the mix with hard sure. to handle. Yep. For sure. So, yeah. Interesting. I love these conversations. Yeah. I like dissecting. Always this stuff. I'm a nerd. You know, it's how I am. Speaking of dissecting, I had a uh, what I believe is the final, but certainly the fourth performance of what's going on on Friday night. The the thing that I was doing last fall, we had this one performance that was booked back then and didn't happen until Friday night. And it was uh, and we didn't rehearse coming into it. We all trusted correctly, it turns out, that each of the other musicians on the stage would do their part to um, reminisce, <laughs> you know, about what we had done in the past and how we had gotten through this thing. Uh, and it, it, you know, but it, it's still like we had really, we had no sound check. We had certainly no rehearsal. And so it was like, all right, we'll take the stage and see what we remember. You know, hopefully, hopefully everybody's got what they need to get through the gig. And but isn't, is there, is there no more rewarding thing than when muscle memory kicks in for a whole band and stuff just happens, right? Yeah, yes. Like, we, but we had only done this three times uh, and, and it was in a compressed period of time and then lots has happened since then, right? So muscle memory wasn't going to be the thing to carry you through all of it. There were moments where the muscle memory was there and it was like, oh yeah, like exactly what you're talking about. But, but this wasn't, eh, you know, it's going to be fine. It was like, no, 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 You, you got to remember what you did. And, you know, I mean, for me, Stu, it's interesting. You know, I have played drum set with Stu before, but, but he, anytime he hires me for these projects, it's always as a percussionist, which is great. I love it. Uh, it's, it's fun. It's different for me and uh, different from what I, you know, do with like fling or bit of pill. Although there's some percussion with Bitter Pill and probably more as that band evolves and we have more room for gear on stage. But, um, you know, it was it was it was fun. It was interesting, but it definitely took some rehearsing time. I, and as as we were setting up, it was it was uh, yeah, everybody was saying, oh, yeah, you know, it was, I had I, there were some things I, I thought I knew the whole thing. I thought I remember the whole thing. And then as I was rehearsing, there were moments where I was like, oh, I remember this. I remember that. <laughs> But it was it was at this club called Blue, uh, Port City Blue in Portland, Maine, and I had never played there before. The rest of the guys had, so I didn't know where, that you were supposed to pull into this back alley and load in. So I loaded in through the front door, which wasn't terrible. Would might have been worse with a drum set, but you know, with a couple of congas and a talking drum, it wasn't a huge deal. But as I walked in the front door, the, there was like a, a stand, a, you know, a set of stanchions with a, a rope between them. Like, so I start moving that and the staff comes over and like, you know, and we, we got to see your vax card first. We got to do this. Like, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Portland's still like still doing that when, when that's not here. So masked in the club and all that, which is totally fine. It was just a like, like, oh, right. I'm not used to this with, you know, everywhere I've been here recently. And it's an interesting thing. They, they the whole, they don't charge a cover, but they do, um, quite well uh, with aggressively encouraging the patrons to tip the band and the club takes care of all that. So it's not up to you to push your tip mm -hmm. jar out. They, you know, they come up, they actually came up halfway through the performance. Normally it would be at a set break, but this is, you know, one long thing. So we, we created a little groove in the middle, a little vibe for them to come up and, and do that. But um there were three, at least three bands that played that night and there's a half hour changeover in between them. And we had to get a Leslie and a B3 and a drum set <laughs> and Stu's his, his guitar and his computer rig and me with my percussion rig on stage in 30 minutes while the other band got their stuff off. Now the band before us was a bluegrass band, so they didn't have anything set up. They just, you know, they walked on with their instruments. They walked off with them. 
and they have a sound system there, but you do your own sound. And I'm still not quite sure. The other, like I said, the other guys had played there, so they knew what was going on. They knew that all this had to happen, but it, it happened in 30 minutes. Like I'm, I'm still not entirely sure how we did all the things that we did in 30 minutes. We were able to get our gear into the club. Like I said, those guys knew about the back door. So they brought their gear into the back of the club and sort of staged it back there. And then just, you know, quickly brought it up to the stage as soon as we had the the opportunity to do that when the other band was finished. But mm -hmm. it was, um, it was amazing how quickly things got on stage and off. Cause there was another band after us. Uh, now we only took up, you know, we, we, Probably could have taken up another half hour with our thing. They, they had, or maybe another 20 minutes. I think the slots were two hours total for the band. So you have an hour and a half to play and then 30 minutes to change over. And then the next band starts. And mm -hmm. we probably only took an hour and, you know, 10 minutes or something with the performance. Cause it's a 35 minute album. We, we stretch out parts of it, but, and it was, it, the nice part was because everybody knew that it, that we hadn't done this in months Everybody hit the stage with big ears. It was almost like the first performance after having rehearsed it, uh, you know, several times. And there was one moment in Right On, which we open up. Uh, there's a, 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 a there's a conga solo that I take, which is fine. I, I'm not a big fan of like just playing solos, but it, it's always fun and it's fine. So I do that. But that's then sets up this organ solo that. For whatever reason, the other night just turned into this full band jam. I mean, it was it 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 the the way I said it as we were leaving the stage was it felt like we were passing the musical baton around, and everybody knew when it was their turn to add to the thing, and then it it just sort of grew. It, it uh, Mike, our our organ player, started playing his solo, and then Stu started soloing on the guitar. It was like okay, but these two things are happening together. Like I didn't even realize these guys could hear each other based on where they're positioned on stage, but it was clear they could, like they were, you know, playing now trading, but playing off of each other. And then it just sort of grew. And the funny part was it, it, it was amazing. It was a really stellar moment. And as, as we were packing up and I, I brought that up to the guys, uh, you know, we were saying, man, that, that was, that was one of those musical highlights. Like, I, we're not going to forget that, you know, and there was this couple that was sitting right up uh, against the stage and they said, uh, they said, yeah, that was awesome. I really, you know, we really like that jam. And I'm like, oh crap, you're not supposed to hear us patting ourselves on the back. I'm like, that's, that's really kind of, you know, bad. That's not part of the performance. And they're like, no, no, you deserve it. You should be patting yourselves on the back. That was amazing. And uh, it was, but it was a nice little moment, you know, it was, um, it was a cool gig. And then, you know, as quickly as we got there and set up, we, we got the everything off the stage and I was in the car on the way home. I was home by like 11 o'clock or something. <laughs> so awesome. yeah, it was, but it was cool. It was a fun gig. I, I don't think I'm doing, I don't think we will have any more performances of that. So if that is the last one, it was a nice way to kind of, you know, wrap up that story. Uh, I do have another thing. I don't know that Stu publishes his future uh, diaspora radio that's what he calls them uh, uh performances these these albums that he covers and so i do have one coming up but i, I won't share the album here on the show because i don't want to uh it's if it's not my news to share i don't want to be the one to share it but, Fair enough. Uh, but it i i get to play percussion again in a pro on a on an album that i will need to rehearse for for sure it, like it's not just a jam like the marvin Gaye record was so it'll be interesting but some fun tunes for sure Keep us posted. I will. I will. <sighs> All right. Well, are we uh, are we there? We good? We're there for today. Okay. Play that Mustang Sally, man. Uh, we will play that Mustang Sally. What? Why don't we play our theme song and say goodbye to everybody? Mm -hmm. I'll have more to share from South by Southwest. Thanks for hanging out with us. And when you're playing that Mustang Sally, always be performing. Always. Thanks for listening, folks. Take it easy. Feedback at gigabpodcast.com.